How are y'all tonight? Very good. I think we got enough people to get started. We got people online. We got enough people here, so let's get started. Father, we just thank you tonight for week five of School of the Eagles. We ask for your revelation to be released. That you'd speak tonight, Father, and have your way in this place. Even take my tongue and release prophetic insight. Father, we ask that you would just release revelation, words of knowledge. You would stir up the gifts of your spirit. Gifts of prophecy be released in this place. Every person online is touched too. Father, stir up those gifts in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I think where we ended last time, you all have to keep me honest because I go in a flow and I forget where I end. I should start marking it. But I think where we ended last week is what to do when you get a word that you want to share with the body of Christ. And I think that's where we ended Amen? Where I want to go tonight is I'm going to begin to dive in a little bit around the actual office of the prophet and some of the things that God wants me to share concerning being in the office of a prophet. Up to this point, <coughs> and forgive me, I'm battling a call from Wisconsin tonight. Amen. <laughs> I'm playing, but it's true. They brought it with them. Amen. Todd knows me. I always pick on Todd. Amen. I still haven't changed in that respect. Amen. I still pick on Todd. It's good to have Todd back in my life. Um, but, you know, I want to talk more about the office of prophecy because up to this point we've been talking about the gift of prophecy. We're talking about how any person can flow in the gift of prophecy and how the Holy Spirit moves from person to person. And we've been talking about some protocol concerning that. Um, after we talk about the office of prophet, we're going to begin to dive in to some prophetic caution and some things that prophets have to be careful of. And I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the character of the prophet, the life of the prophet, what God expects of the prophet, all these types of things. And uh, by the way, I want you, as we're talking about the office of prophet, I want you to remember what I've been stressing this whole course, that it's not about the title, it's about the function. Amen? So first of all, we talk about the office of prophet. We know we talked about the first week, week one, about how God has given some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be teachers, some to be pastors, and some to be evangelists. We know that every one of us has a role and a purpose in the kingdom of God. I believe that it's very interesting that Jesus divided himself into five instead of one. But there is something in this last days that requires the apostles and the prophets to be released upon the nations. I believe you're in an hour right now that God is reestablishing the true fivefold ministry. You know, I know you've been to a lot of ministries that said they have a true fivefold ministry, but to be honest with you, I don't think many ministries actually have operated in a true fivefold ministry. Most churches you go to are operating in a one-fold or two-fold, and we talked about that. Maybe it's all prophetic church. Maybe it's all teaching church. But anytime God moves, he brings order, and he releases his word. Now, I noticed, and I'm going to use our church as an illustration a little bit tonight, too. If you notice, God is starting to move in our church and starting to grow our church. But the way he's doing it is he's bringing order in order to do it. In order for his Holy Spirit and the work for his Holy Spirit to do upon the earth, he has to first set the foundation in the order. Just like you're building a church, just like you're building a home, there has to first be a firm foundation, and next there has to be order. And see, apostles and prophets, they're chemistry of how they're made up and how they're motivated is they are put on earth to bring order and foundation. I believe that the apostles in particular, and I will do some training on ap apostolic later, but not in this course, but the apostolic vision is, is more of a governmental authority to set up that structure in the kingdom of God. 
That's why apostles are important because they're overseers. They, they're seeing things through the eyes of God around authority and structure and that kind of thing. But also prophets are the same way. Prophets hear from God and actually release the word of God in how to do what we need to do in the church. If a prophet hears God, they can release direction from the Lord on how to put the church in order or how to build the ministry the way God wants it built. We, in this hour, are going to begin to see more of an apostolic and more of a prophetic mantle released on the earth. Because any time that God gets ready to move, he is going to often move through the prophet first to speak the word of God. See, any time God's going to bring change, he's going to say it first. If God is about to do something, he first says it. He is going to establish it through more than one prophet. You're not going to have solo prophets. They have their own word from God. Every prophet will be saying the same thing. I believe we're entering an hour right now where prophets are being raised up and apostles are being raised up all over the world. Not for a title, but for work. I believe that prophets are all receiving a direct impartation right now, a mantle, so to speak, of the latter rain. Now, I'm not going to get into that teaching right now, but there's an end-time anointing. Let me tell you what I believe God's doing. I'm going to give you a high-level view of that. How many of you studied the life of Elijah? Now, Elijah is my favorite character in the Bible. I, I have a passion. I've had dreams of things that I didn't even know were in the Bible that were related to Elijah. And I would wake up and say, what is this dream from? And later the Lord would show me that Elijah actually did what I dreamt about. And so I began to have dreams. I'm going to give you an example of that. One of the dreams that I had was that I was trying to get a church going. And we had, a, we had this church building we were sharing with other ministries in the dream. And the people saw all the people coming in, and they tried to shove me out because the Holy Spirit was bringing them in. So I ended up fleeing that church, and I went to a field. And in the field, I was standing there, and a man was talking to me. And yet in the distance, I could see all these armies that were coming from the church that I left or the ministry that I had left. Because in the dream, you see, what happened originally is that they got jealous and tried to take over the ministry, but then I stayed there and was faithful, and God brought more. That was before I went to the field. But I'm not, that's not the part of the dream I want to concentrate on. I'm out in the field, and a man's talking to me. And I see these armies coming single file, rank and file, out towards me. And as they're coming towards me, all of a sudden, I looked up in the sky and I saw flashes of lightning, and I saw lions, you know what lions look like, all in the sky. And then the next thing I know, I'm calling down the fire to destroy the armies. And the first army fell down simultaneously, every soldier, and, and they were dead. But the other two groups of army squads kept advancing towards me. And then I said, now in the name of Jesus... I called down the fire on the rest of them, and the fire came and consumed the other two armies. So, you know, you imagine when I woke up in the morning, I was really kind of, what in the world is this dream about? And I'll be honest with you, it freaked me out. This is not the only dream that I've had that can be actually traced back to things of Elijah. So I went pastor to pastor back then because I wasn't a pastor of a church at that time. And I said, I don't understand this dream. Come on, tell me you know what this means. Nobody, of course, knew. One day the Lord spoke to me. He says, you know, it's in the Word. I said, what do you mean? The Lord said, go to your Bible. Began to show me. I believe it's in 1 Kings. <coughs> if you remember, Elijah sitting on a hill, and the king sends his commander out with an army to go fetch him. What happened was he was calling down the fire, and each army was being consumed, and by the time the last commander got there, he was in fear of being consumed by the fire. So he begged Elijah to come down, and Elijah did. 
So I actually had a dream that was in the Bible and didn't even know it was in the Bible. Where I'm going with this is that I've had a lot of dreams about Elijah. So I began to study Elijah. I began to pray about Elijah. I said, God, there's got to be a revelation here for me. And I heard a pastor, it was a woman pastor, and she was preaching about Elisha. You know that Elisha received a double portion of what Elijah had. And if you remember, right before Elisha, who had the double portion, died, in fact, if you count up all the miracles, he actually did double what Elijah did. But if you look at his end of his life, he had no one to pass the anointing on to. Now, I'm, I'm sharing a revelation with you. I'm hoping you're going to get this because it's a little deep for this class. And when I get into some of the, the deeper teachings about Elijah, you might be interested in coming to those sessions. But Elisha, who had the double portion, right before he died, he had no one to pass on the mantle, a prophet. He had no one to pass his anointing to. God had not found any man to be obedient enough to receive that anointing. There was a king. And in one last opportunity, Elisha said to him, go to the window. I believe the window was facing which direction? The east? I'm trying to remember off the top of my head because I'm being led by the Spirit of God tonight. I think it was the east. I'm not sure. It could have been the west. But he said what? He said, take all of your arrows and shoot them out the window. Do you remember what the king did? He did not obey the command of God. He only shot a few arrows. He didn't shoot all his arrows. So what ended up happening after that is they lost the battle. Right? And then what happened to Elisha shortly after? He died. But he took his anointing with him to the grave. And while he was in the grave, dead in the ground, his anointing was still in the grave. How do I know that? Because they took a dead body of an average man, and threw him in the same grave where Elisha was buried, and he came back to life. And now I can feel the anointing of God all over me right now. See, this is a revelation that God gave me. He said, Michael, at that time, no one was worthy to carry the mantle. No one was worthy to carry the anointing of that time. Guess what the latter rain is? That's what I believe by the Spirit of God. It's the Elisha anointing. It's the anointing that Jesus walked in. When Jesus came, he was walking in that anointing. But we are his sons and his daughters. Guess who's now walking in that anointing? He said, you'll do these things in my name. Amen. Lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. But you're entering into a latter reign. In fact, Jesus said something profound. He said, you'll do greater works than what I did. Yet in my lifetime, I've never seen greater works than what Jesus did. Get ready, because that's why apostles and prophets are being raised up. So I believe that the office of prophet will be even used more in the last days, not less. How do I know that? Well, go look at the Bible, read in Revelation, about the two prophets who are at the Wailing Wall. That already proves they'll be prophets. And by the way, that doesn't mean they'll be the only two prophets. Nowhere in the Bible does it say they're going to be the only two prophets, you don't know how many prophets there will be. Nobody knows. There could be two prophets. There could be many prophets. But I believe they will be empowered by God. When you look at the Old Testament and you study the Old Testament prophet and you compare that to the New Testament prophet, you see some distinct differences. In the Old Testament, they were empowered by God and they did a lot more than prophesy. In the Old Testament... They laid hands on sick and they were healed. They could raise dead people in the name of the Lord. If you remember, the man of God went to the widow, asked her for her last meal that she was feeding her son. Let me tell you a revelation about that. The woman and her son were about to die after that last meal. But the prophet who left the river that had dried up now goes to his next place of provision, which in the natural didn't look like a place of provision. It looked like a last meal. But see, he had anointing to multiply. Who else had anointing to multiply? 
in the Bible. Jesus. Jesus took and created wine out of water. Jesus borrowed somebody else's meal, wasn't even his own meal, and multiplied it and gave it. He had the ability to double, quadruple, multiply, a spirit of multiplication. Now, I'm trying to help you because Elijah walked in the same anointing. Elijah walked in the multiplication anointing. How do I know? Because her food never ran out after that. Her oil never ran dry, even though they were in a time of a famine. But here's another revelation maybe you haven't considered. That woman didn't stop at blessing the man of God just with her food. She gave him something else. She gave him a room to sleep in. Do you remember that? So what happened? She had no way to know that later her son would become ill. Yet the very room that she gave the man of God was the seed that was needed for his being brought back from the dead. Because not only did her son get sick, her son died. And we know in the Old Testament that there's only a few people that moved in that gift of raising the dead. Elijah was one of them. Amen? He had the anointing. He laid his body down upon the child, and it came back to life. Why? Because there was anointing all through that man. See, prophets have that type of anointing. Jesus, <coughs> when he came out with a five-fold ministry, there's two offices in particular, maybe three. Occasionally you see this in evangelism too, but apostles... Prophets and evangelists move in supernatural. They move in the supernatural. That's the same Elijah anointing that came upon Jesus that he now gave to us. And by the way, he said, it's necessary that I die. Why did he say it was necessary that he die? That the Holy Spirit come to you. That you receive the comforter. What he was really saying is, you are going to receive empowerment. You're going to receive anointing. Do you remember any miracles that Jesus did before he was baptized? Anybody remember any miracles Jesus did before he was baptized? That was after, I believe, he was baptized. Somebody validate that. What's that? Wasn't his time. I, I don't remember exactly if it was before or not, but there's not many miracles he did is my point. Somebody validate when he did the wine. Everybody can look that up. I believe he was baptized already after John the Baptist. But what happened when he was baptized? Good point. When he was baptized, what happened to him? What does the Bible say? The Bible says the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. Amen? It descended upon him like a dove. That means it was peaceful. It means the Holy Spirit came upon him. That means when he was being baptized and he was being obedient to be baptized, that the power of God came on him because of his obedience. Because we heard the Lord say something to him. The Lord says, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. So there was an empowerment. There was an anointing. And I believe it's the same anointing that I'm referring to, the Elijah anointing. Amen? And some asked, is this Elijah? Even the question was asked. Because they were seeing things that had not been seen since the days of Elijah. Are you all understanding where I'm going with this? There were miracles happening that the church had not been operating in until Jesus came. In the New Testament, they couldn't flow in the Elijah of miracles. That's why when he came, they thought it was Elijah. Because no one else had walked in that kind of power and authority. And the, I'm hoping you're getting the revelation of what I'm sharing. This is the anointing that God has given our generation, the latter rain. We're talking about the office of prophet, not to puff you up with pride, but for you to release miracles to the nations. Every prophetic school that I've been to has been teaching one aspect of being a prophet. That aspect has been saying what you hear God say prophesying but just as you are more complex as a person than what you look like on the outside 
There is more to a prophet than prophesying. Are you understanding the revelation of that? When I look at my brother Ray, I know certain things about Ray, but I can guarantee you there's a lot of depth to Ray that I don't know and a lot of gifts in Ray that I don't know about and things Ray can flow in that I don't know he can flow in. There are different levels that you go into in, as being a prophet we talk so much about prophecy, but you need to understand there's an empowerment, too, for the position. No matter what position God has put you in, no matter what office God's put you in, there's a mantle. There is an empowerment to do what he's commissioned you to do. Prophets are not just to say things that God says. Prophets are to release something on the earth. That's the best way I could describe it. Jesus didn't come just to come on the earth. He released something on the earth. He released things into people. He had the power of God. If he said something, it came to pass. He was empowered by God, yet he never abused his position. He only did what he saw his father doing. And he saw his father healing people. He saw miracles. When people didn't have money to pay their bills, the Lord would tell them what to do. And because he said it, it was there. Go cast your line into the sea. The first fish you catch, take the coin out of its mouth. Men had been fishing all night long, didn't have provision. Jesus comes along and says, why are you getting frustrated? Well, because we've been fishing all night, we've not caught anything, Master. He says, cast your net on the other side of the boat. Now, let me tell you something. These were experienced fishermen. They knew what side they should have been fishing on in the natural. But the man of God had the anointing and the empowerment that if he said it, it came to pass. See, I believe that there's a level of faith in this Elisha anointing that we've not tapped into yet. Man, I know this is deep stuff, but I'm hoping you're getting it. I've not really had a format where I could really just share my heart like this, right? Because of preaching, I'm preaching a word. I'm giving what God has given me to say, but I've not really been able to expound on things. I've not really been able to take, take it up and just make it so you can see it. We've been taught only one aspect of being a prophet, but there is more to being a prophet than saying the word of God. You are called to signs, wonders, and miracles. We should be seeing more signs, wonders, and miracles than we are seeing in the church. We've got a lot of people who have the title that don't have the power. We got a lot of people taking the title, but we don't see any fruit for the office. If I call you a teacher, that implies you teach. That implies you have the gift of teaching. That implies that you have the knowledge to teach the subject that you're teaching. That implies that God gives you wisdom of how to communicate in a way that people can receive it. It's not just what you teach. It's all the other aspects of what it takes to be a true teacher. It's not just you can hear God as a prophet because anybody can hear God. We've been talking about how even a donkey prophesied in the Bible. It doesn't matter you can hear God. That doesn't mean you're a prophet. You don't want to take on the title of prophet if you're not a prophet because then you take on the spiritual attacks that come with the office and you won't be empowered to fight against the attacks that you're under. Now, I know you've never heard that taught in many places. But don't you understand that God gives you his word to establish something? God wants to establish a move in this hour on the earth. 
And when God does something, he gives the instruction that's needed to carry it out. But he also provides and meets the need. Now, back in the Old Testament, if you prophesied something and it didn't happen, you were killed. Why? Because you were considered a false prophet. Why? Because everybody knew that the prophet or the man of God was empowered to make it happen. If he was God's voice, there would be provision for what is said, and it should take place. We get to the New Testament, and we see that we see in part, and we know in part. We see we prophesy in part. We see that many are just speaking things that could be out of the carnal mind, that could be made up, that could be from the wrong spirit. I believe there's a move of the Holy Spirit right now to raise up true prophets of God that will be able to discern the voice of God versus the voice of flesh versus the voice of the enemy. The reason that prophets are subject to prophets is that prophets are supposed to be able to discern what's of God, what's of flesh, what's of the enemy. That's why nobody wants there to be any submission to other people or any accountability to other people in an office. But if we have no accountability, then we are only one step away from false doctrine. We're only one false step away from error. We could actually proclaim things on this earth that God has no intention of doing. Amen? We, as a prophetic people, need to understand that God is judging every word that we say. My heart has to be right. I've got to hear God. Not just to give a word, but I know that when I say something, I can either make or break someone's life. Amen? I know that the tongue has the power of life and death. That anointing that was at the beginning of the earth, God was upon the earth in his spirit form, amen, and in his natural form. I know that because he walked in the, uh, uh, the garden uh, with Adam and Eve, amen. But everything he did was through his tongue. He spoke, and the earth was formed. He spoke, and the seas were separated from the land. He spoke, and animals were created. The only time that he did something that I remember that was not speaking is when he took the dust of the ground and created man. And he breathed into man. Every other reference is he spoke and it happened. He spoke and it happened. He spoke and it happened. Do you remember Elisha? He comes, he says there's going to be a drought. God's going to shut up the heavens. There'll be no rain. Everybody thought he was a joke. But the man of God prophesied, and as soon as he prophesied as a prophet of God, the Lord responded and shut up the windows of heaven. It no longer rained for a period of time. The men that will be at the wall, the last two prophets that are mentioned in the Bible, they will have the power over the weather. You, you need to write that down, they will. By the way, who else had the power over weather other than Elijah? Jesus. He spoke to the storm, be still. Told the winds to stop. That's why I'm telling you it's the same anointing that was there in the prophets that was passed on to Jesus through the Father. That's the same anointing. Amen? It's the same anointing. You have power over weather. That means... I'm going to give you a real-life example of this because God made me a believer of it. I was in Africa. I was living in conditions that many of you would not want to live in. I was waiting to go to the crusade grounds that night in a little building with a tin roof, very hot. It began to rain. It began to storm. So badly, in fact, I don't think I've ever been in a rainstorm quite that bad. The whole time I'm praying, I said, God, I guess we're not going to the crusade grounds. I guess we're not having meetings. And the Lord rebuked me. 
And he said to me, I'm not in the storm. <laughs> I'm not in the wind. I'm not in the rain. I'm a still small voice. I, was, I thought that was odd. Why did God say that to me? Because only three blocks away where the crusade was being held, not one raindrop hit the ground. Not one raindrop hit the ground. Now, I'm not going to get into a doctrine on this, but the enemy, by the way, has certain authority on the earth. And you don't think that he uses weather to attack people? I can tell you, rest assured, he does. But you have authority over the weather. See, a lot of people aren't claiming their authority. You're a prophet. You have authority over the weather. I have gone outside and prophesied to the storm. I have prophesied to the storm because God told me to. I said, storm be gone. I've heard testimonies of farmers in the 1920s, 1930s. Tornadoes hit regions. Hail hit regions. They were farmers back then. This farmer was a Christian. That farmer was not a Christian. The f I even have a picture of this, of two farmers, a man and a wife, out in the field praying. And I have a picture of this on my wall at home because that picture spoke to me. See, that man and woman, they were Christians. They went out to the field, and they stood in the field, and they prayed that God would spare their crops of all the storms that were heading their way. When the storms came, it's like it skipped the Christian farms and only hit the world's farms. I've read testimonies of this. You have power as a prophet. It's not to be abused, amen, it's God gives you empowerment. I know I've hit that hard, but I want you to understand that being a prophet is much deeper than prophesying. You, you just say something arbitrarily. You make a comment arbitrarily. You know that that can have power. I've been in conversations. Now, let me tell you something. I've been in general conversations. Something slipped out of my mouth. I didn't mean it that way. It's come to pass. When I was a young man, and I do believe sometimes the gifts are without repentance. Yes, I do, but I believe that they're tuned as you get closer to God. They're more of God as you go. I'm not going to go there. But when I was a young man, I had a dog. And my dog's name was Puppy, believe it or not. <coughs> my dad named that dog Puppy. I said, yeah, that's a puppy. What's his name? Puppy. Amen. But I remember one day, Puppy was outside. My parents weren't home, and Puppy kept barking really loud. And I remember as a child, I was a teenager, I said, I wish that dog would just go and die. I'm tired of hearing that barking. That night, my dad came home. He says, where's Puppy at? I'm like, I don't know. He was barking up a storm earlier. I don't know where he is. My dad went looking for him. The next day, he found him in the woods. He had gone in there and died. See, we have power in our tongues. Prophets have a lot of power in their tongues. There are things in my life that I've seen because I didn't know I was a prophet. I ended up seeing things happen that I didn't even know God was doing through me. Amen? Am I speaking to anybody? Because y'all getting quiet on me. This is deep stuff. We're going a little too deep tonight? All right. But you have power in your tongue, and... See, prophets don't realize the responsibility they have to watch their tongue. See, if I speak everything that's in me to speak, I could destroy lives. I can delay a move of God. Amen? I can interfere with what he's doing. Now, God's still sovereign. He'll override me. I don't mean to imply that what I say is more powerful than God, not by any means. But I can really cause damage in the kingdom of God if I don't say only what he's saying to say. There is power released, but also there's bad things released every day through mouths of prophets. Prophets don't realize they can actually go in and shift an atmosphere in a church by one word they speak. You have the power as a prophet to go in and shift a whole atmosphere of a church. Not just the atmosphere, but the direction the church is going in. One wrong word you can steer the ship the wrong way. And when I leave and I go somewhere to speak, I better be sure God said it because it's going to go in motion the minute I say it. 
Now, some people looked at me like crazy when I've come to a meeting and I've prophesied some crazy stuff that God told me to say. Like I saw certain individuals doing certain things. I only told the pastor about it. I don't see that happening. Our prophet, that won't happen. I warned him. A year later, coming to me, everything you said came to pass. Now, I don't like releasing words like that. But sometimes God gives pastors opportunities to pray. Amen? And sometimes as a prophet, you're going to be the warning. You're going to be the one that God sends to warn the people. And if they don't have ears to hear God, they will just blow it off. Amen? There are directional shifts that God wants to take people's lives. There's directional shifts that God wants to put ministries in. And it's through the power of the tongue. Amen. Praise God. Being a prophet can be a rough road. There, you know, as a prophet of God, you're going to get attacked. You're going to have to go through what I call humility school. Amen? Humility school. I believe we should get a degree in humility. Amen? I believe that God needs to raise up schools all over the nation and just call them humility school. I believe it's a class that every Christian should go through. But guess what? That's not the reality. Humility school is not a class you take. Humility school is what you have to go through. Amen? Humility school is when God allows those conflicts, when God allows those things to come against you as a prophet of God, and that is to refine you, that is to change you, that is to prepare you, that is to make you the fine wine. Now, I did a whole teaching series on the new wine. And what I mean by the new wine is that there is a new wine God is releasing in the atmosphere. The new wine is through the crushing of the grapes and the pressing of the grapes. You cannot make wine without crushed or pressed grapes. And by the way, the wine press, if you put a grape there, by the way, and you begin to apply pressure, it's a gradual process. Because if God was to crush you, you wouldn't be able to get back up. But God loves to press us. He loves to get us in the wine press. He likes to put pressure on us to get us to conform, to get us in position, to get us ready for what he wants us to do. I don't see many prophets in the Bible that wanted to go and do things for God. Jonah was one of the most reluctant prophets. I think, to be honest with you, if you're a true prophet of God, most of the time you don't want to do it. <laughs> Amen? I think most of the time you don't want to go through it. I believe if you're a true prophet of God, most of the time you're not signing up for it. But God will call on your name. And by the way, that's how you know if you're called to be a prophet, when God calls you by name. He will begin to work in your spirit and tell you, I've called you to be a prophet. I've called you to be a prophet to the nations. He'll begin to speak to you in your spirit, but he also speaks audibly sometimes to people. He appears to people. A lot of prophets actually have a God encounter. Samuel was in his room just trying to sleep, but God had already chosen him. Jeremiah says, he already knew you in your mother's womb. Amen? He already knew you when you are in your mother's womb. Or is that Isaiah? I can't remember. Maybe it was Jeremiah. Jeremiah, that's right. I already knew you when you were in your mother's womb. He's the one that formed you. He was the one that already destined you to be a prophet to the nations. He had already selected you. See, but you didn't, when you were born, you didn't know who you were. When you were born, you didn't know you were a prophet. You didn't know that you were called to the nations. That's something God doesn't show you the whole picture all the time. But you have a, as you get closer to God, he'll begin to call out to you. He'll begin to tell you, I've called you for this hour. I've called you to be a prophet to the nations. That's what he told me. And that was when I was a Baptist, when I didn't believe prophets even existed, when I thought apostles and prophets were dead because that's what they taught me in the Baptist church. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, when the perfect comes, all these things shall cease. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 
The Baptists have taken that to mean that when Jesus came the first time, all these things passed away. They ceased. But in reality, I believe that's when Jesus comes the second time. So I have a doctrinal difference of opinion. God has spoke to me. God told me before I was even spirit-filled that he called me to particular offices, two of them. And I thought I had lost my mind. But when you are called to be a prophet, you're going to know you're a prophet. I'm, a lot of people come to me, how do I know I'm a prophet? Well, if you don't know, you're probably not one. Do you hear me? And a lot of us are getting consumed on whether I'm a prophet or not. You spend all your waking hours, am I a prophet? You go to every pastor, am I a prophet? Why don't you just practice prophesying and find out? The Bible says a man's gift makes room for him in the Bible. We got people trying to find out, am I this, am I that, and you're limiting God. This is what happened to me, folks. God began to take me in seasons of prophesying. Then I didn't really prophesy. Then he took me in seasons of evangelism. Then he took me in seasons of preaching. Then he took me in seasons of praying for the sick. But every one of them was tied to my office and didn't even know it. When I was evangelizing, I had pastors say, you should be the head of evangelism. You're called to be an evangelist. When I was preaching, people said, man, you're going to be a preacher, you're going to be a pastor, you're going you're gonna to be an evangelist, I don't know what, but they were trying to label me. When I was prophesying, oh, you're a prophet. When I was praying for the sick, oh, you're an evangelist. Too hung up on the titles. Trying to label people. You can't label a prophet. Before God tells you you're a prophet, a lot of times you won't know yet. Just be obedient in stepping out in the gifts that you have. You are actually on the job being trained right now. Every time you go to Walmart, you're on training ground. Every time you go to your job, you're being trained. Every time your mama calls you and says, please pray for my friend that's sick, you're being trained. Every time you have a dream at night, you're being trained. Every time you get a word from God, you're being trained. And if you're a prophet, you will see in a few years that you're actually being trained to be a prophet. Everything God has spent time doing with you is part of your office. Because, see, what we've been taught is prophets just prophesy. No. No. You do a lot more than that. Amen? Because God does a total work. And see, by the way, I don't want to get into minor prophets, major prophets, master prophets. Let's talk about that for a minute. So, there are people that like to be higher than other people who love titles. And I have bumped into these leaders. They'll ask me, are you a master prophet? Are you a major prophet or are you a minor prophet? I look at them and say, I'm just a prophet. I'm just a lowly prophet. Amen. By the way, I don't like the term master prophet. It's not scriptural. That makes it sound like I'm still in slavery in Egypt. That means somebody else is over me. I'm not, I don't have no master but Jesus. Amen. Amen. And if you want to call yourself master, you better look out, you enslaving people. It's not scriptural. There's nothing in the Bible that says there was a master prophet. Yet you know, we got people going around saying, I'm a master prophet. You're not a master of anything. You better get some humility because any prophet can miss it. That means you're not a master in itself. Praise God. I'm not a master of anything. I am dependent on the Holy Spirit to give me revelation. I'm dependent on the Holy Spirit to speak through me. And if I miss it, I have to repent and I have to correct myself. If anything, I need to master myself. Amen? Now, y'all look at me, but how many of y'all heard the term master prophet already in your life? I'm not going to tell you what ministries practice that. Then we had other people who come to me and say, are you a major prophet or are you a minor prophet? They're talking about the prophets of the Old Testament. Some of the prophets performed miracles, some of them didn't. So they're going around saying, I'm a major prophet because I'm moving miracles. You're just a minor prophet. You just say what God says. You're like a parrot prophet. You just parrot what God says. Amen? 
I'm being real. We got parrot prophets, master prophets. We got major prophets. No, we don't. A prophet is a prophet is a prophet, and a prophet is subject to a prophet. And by the way, I don't even need the name prophet to prophesy. I'm just a prophet. A prophet, not the prophet. A prophet. Amen? Right now we have a serious issue in the church. When you begin to step out in your office, you begin to step out in your gifts, you better be careful because a lot of the people will see your true gift of prophecy, see your true office of prophet in the mantle on your life, and they will begin to suck you in. Now, this is what happened to me when I first started ministering in this area. I had ministries that would come to me and seek me out. Well, prophet, you need to come to my meetings. <laughs> you know, all the other prophets are going to be there. We're going to have a gathering of prophets. And we got to the point where we had more prophets than we did people to minister to. And we didn't even minister to the people. We were ministering one to another. Now, not we, because I didn't. I didn't play that game long. I was prophesying to the people that needed to be prophesied to, encouraging them while they were prophesying to each other and cut me off because they were not comfortable with my style. Amen? But I will tell you, as a prophet, you're going to sometimes go in and you're going to be like Jesus. You're going to turn over money carts. You're going to walk in and you're going to turn over some money, money changer tables. Amen? Because, see, those prophets get spelled differently than your prophet. Now, I'll just say it, P-R-O-F-I-T versus the P-R-O-P-H-E-T. We've got a lot of prophets, P-R-O-F-I-T's. We don't have a lot of ministry going on. What time is it now? Where's the clock? Got moved on me? Ten till? All right, praise God. I'm just trying to be conscious of that. Amen. Praise God. The reality is that we have a lot of people right now in the kingdom of God that need the office of prophet to raise up. I believe churches need the office of prophet to raise up. If we don't have the true prophetic gifts rise up, the true prophetic offices rise up, the true apostolic rise up, we're going to continue to see religion. We're going to continue to see tradition in the church. See, people are dying in the church. The reason that God is raising these people up right now is because he wants to deliver his people. Anytime God wanted to deliver his people in the Old Testament, what did he do? He rose up a prophet amongst them. How did he deliver his people from Egypt? He rose up a prophet. His name was Moses. Moses left everything of the world behind. Moses did not have an attachment to the world. He left his position in high stature. He left his place in the palace. He gave up fortune. He gave up fame. He left everything to go to the wilderness where he was trained. Y'all have to pray for me. I'm asking y'all to pray for me because lately, so I feel like it's getting ready to happen to me. So I'm, I'm very scared. Amen? I'll be real. I'm just, my heart hasn't been in my job. My heart's in ministry. And then, you know, do I need this? Do I need that anymore? Do I care about this anymore? Do I care about that anymore? That's what happened to Moses. He had to come to a place where, you know what? As a prophet, sometimes God's going to say, just give all that up and follow me. Go with me in the wilderness. Trust me to provide. Trust me to meet the need. There's a lot of prophets right now that God's raising up that way. And see, right now, we have to have the mentality of Moses. If God says leave everything to do it, do it. It's hard because we live in an hour right now where how's God going to do that? Prophets are being raised up and it's a hard walk. It's a lonely walk because not everybody's going to understand you. Pastors will definitely not understand you. They'll try to, but they won't understand you because you are made differently. Amen? It's like me trying to understand my wife. Now, she's not here to defend herself, so I can use an example. I always use that example. 
but I have to be careful what I say because I want to go home to a wife that smiles when I walk in the door. But have you ever tried to understand your wife, men? We, we think we understand, but we only understand to a certain level our wives. Amen? To be honest with you. There's only a certain level. We've learned how to coexist for the most part with our wives. You know, we know what to say, what not to say. We know when not to use a tone, when we can get away with using a tone. We, we know her pet peeves. We know what upsets her. Amen? She's complex. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 But you know what? So are prophets. So are prophets. Because they can do things and say things that are come across abrasive. They can do things that look like they're insensitive. They can do things that look like they don't fit in with the rest of the body of Christ. And we have to know how to function with them. See, pastors have to learn how to function with a prophet. A prophet has to learn how to function with a pastor. There's something that happens in us. God begins to, to break us down and build us back up again. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm learning that more and more prophets went through attacks as children. Not every one of them, but a lot of them have. The devil already knew what they were called to do when they came on the earth, and he, he immediately began to set the situations up and immediately began to set up the circumstances to begin to attack them to destroy the mouth of the prophets before they even were born. Where do you think abortion's coming from? I can tell you a lot of prophets are being killed off through abortions. The devil does not want them in the world. So he's using man to sin to stop the end time move of God or delay it. But guess what? He cannot stop it. All he can do is delay it. Jesus has said, this shall come to pass. And we are in the final days. And no matter how many of us have been attacked as prophets, no matter how many prophets he's tried to destroy, as Jezebel tried to destroy all the prophets, she couldn't kill them all. Amen? And God's voice still prevailed. And God still released what he wanted upon the earth in spite of a Jezebel spirit trying to kill the prophets of God. Satan's no different. He knows that God is sending prophets and apostles to the nations. And he's working very hard to try to destroy them before they even get here. And see, what happens when we get under attack as prophets is we tend to internalize everything. We tend to keep things inside of ourselves. Unforgiveness, bitterness, anger resentment every attack that i mentioned there is against one thing you being able to love other people to harden you as a prophet to get you to move out of the wrong spirit so you will not be effective for god as a prophet his goal is to harden the prophet to harden them so much that when they speak they only speak judgment and guess what happens? The world rejects that spirit that's in them. The world rejects the hardness of it. They can have a true word of God, but they have a hardness about them that's not received by the world. See, I'm going to tell you something. The world has hardened their heart towards God, and the devil's trying to harden prophets towards one another. And see, I'm here to teach how to break through, to walk in humility, to walk in brokenness. I'm writing a book right now that has not been finished. Two of them, actually. I'm halfway through both of them. One is The Broken Prophet. The other is Prophet, Come Out of Your Cave. There's two books I'm writing, and I never have finished them, and God's going to have to give me. He's been convicting me lately. The Broken Prophet is about the prophet who's broken, where there's nothing left of me anymore where I'm usable by God because I'm no longer anything left of me. And prophet come out of your cave is all those prophets that have got into offense, that have got into fear, that have got into unforgiveness, that have got into rejection. They're all hiding in their caves at home instead of being part of the body of Christ. 
now they think their ministry is just to go on the streets, the highways, and the byways and not be part of a church. Although the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves is the manner of some. You are called to be part of the church, not to be an island to yourself. The devil is chasing you in a cave. He's putting pressure on you so you'll get out of position and not do what God has called you to do. So if you're here tonight and you know you're called to be a prophet, you need to stop running from God. You need to let him break you like man breaks a fine stallion, let him break you. You know when you find a wild horse and you try to ride that wild horse, what happens? He bucks you off. He goes crazy. He's not tamed. You can't take a bunch of wild horses into battle, can you? Whenever you've seen a horse army with soldiers on them, they know how to stand at attention. They're disciplined. They're broken by the master. They're so disciplined, they can all stand still next to each other in single file. And when the master says charge, they all charge at the same time because they've been fully trained and have surrendered their lives to that leader or that master. We are like a fine stallion as a prophet. We are, some of us are still wild Mustangs. Amen? Some of us are still going a little wild. Others of us have learned to be disciplined by God and allowed him to discipline us. And now we're ready and fit for battle. Amen. That's where we're going to end tonight. Wow, there's a lot of meat in that tonight. An hour goes by fast. Praise God. I am going to open the floor again for any questions tonight. That's what we'll do tonight. Was that good? Y'all enjoy that? Amen. I'm sure it posed a lot of questions you might have. Did anybody look up whether he turned to, I thought it was the first miracle he did after he was baptized, but I can't remember. Was he baptized yet when he did the, yep, yeah, yeah, I, I'm almost positive he was baptized first, but I wanted to validate, make sure I wasn't in error, amen, and I'm correctable if I miss it, so sometimes we can get our facts wrong when we're up here in the hot seat, amen, so thank you for confirming. All right, anybody have any questions tonight? Praise God. I'm going to leave that up for you guys to come up and get the microphone if you have any questions. Everybody can line. Come on. It's not a question, but it's what I was, what you said tonight covered what I was asking you last time about the different levels of profit. That's what I was trying to get at. Because I've always was taught, oh, no, you're, you're, you're prophesying. You know, it's different levels. You got to go in the holies of holies. And I'm like, okay. So, you, you, you clear, yeah. God is not a respecter of persons. If he does it for you, he'll do it for me. Amen. Any other questions? Praise God. But as you grow in your gift, you're going to see more miracles happen because you have more faith. And it's like any ministry, the more faith you have. Y'all need to do some jumping jacks or something tonight. Y'all are all tired tonight. I see it. I'm looking around I'm like, oh, y'all are tired tonight, aren't you? All y'all tired. Christina gave me some smiles. Todd gave me some smiles. Ray gave me some smiles. Y'all look tired tonight. Amen. Anyway, let's just then let's just end in prayer. And we're going to pray for all the people online as well. Just for a release of his spirit, activation of your gifts. Amen. I hope you're getting some nuggets in these classes that you've never heard before, too. Because I get an opportunity to really share some things, like I said, that are from my heart. Amen? What God's been parted to me. Father, we just thank you for each person tonight, God. We ask for a fresh impartation of your Holy Spirit. We ask for a fresh activation of your gifts. Father, we ask that you pour out your Spirit on all people here, Father, tonight. Under the sound of my voice, I speak to those gifts of prophecy, those gifts of healing, those gifts of deliverance, those gifts of discernment, those words of knowledge, those words of wisdom. And Father, we stir up those gifts right now in Jesus' name. We call them forth into the body of Christ. We come against every obstacle that's tried to come against them to stop the gifts of God in them. And Father, we just bless each person in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love you guys. 
Bless you.